of the book is us being able to view what heaven looks like. And heaven looks just like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes down upon Jesus like a dove. And then a voice echoes out of heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well placed. Every single human wants to have those words spoken. Don't you? I was uh, 35 years old when a very similar story that Anne was asking Hubert about. I want to see where you were, were raised. Um, I was 35, <coughs> pastoring in Cleveland. And uh, I got my dad up and I said, Dad, um, I want you to come up and just spend some time with me because I really don't know who you are. My dad and I had a, on a good day, it was a bad relationship. When I was 17, I had a knockdown drag out fight with him, and I left the house, started driving away. My, my first thought was, what the heck have I just done? <laughs> so I've got no place to live, and I'm too proud to go home and say I was wrong. Didn't get much better. I then met Jesus, and I needed to find a way to mend that relationship. <clears throat> So he did. He came up. Uh, we had some great conversations until one day I asked him a very probing question. Here it was. Dad, why, why were you so hard on me? When Angie and I got married, one of my parents' good friends said to Angie, um, I don't know why Dave's dad was so tough on he was never that way with his two sisters, but they, he was on Nick. And Dad told me this story, and all of a sudden it made sense. He was telling the story about why Dad was such a driven man. I mean, he worked all of the time. And he never said a nice word to me that I can recall ever. He was hard on me. Why, Dad? He told me the story about his father. His father, he said, was a shoe salesman. He said this, and he wasn't even any good at that. And one day, my dad, who was seven years old, came home, and everybody in the house was crying. He couldn't figure out why. It's because his dad knew he was a failure and put a shotgun in his mouth. He will tell. I'm 35 years old when I hear this for realize that's why he's so hard on me he doesn't want me to be a failure so I work as hard as I can to please him because I want my father <coughs> to what <coughs> say these nice words I work and I work and I work and it never happens <coughs> get promoted, no words. I graduate first in my class, no words. <clears throat> Angie and I are moving back from Canada to come back to Indiana Weston. And Angie went to visit her parents in, in West Virginia, and I went to visit my dad, who's dying in a nursing home. And I come in, and I cannot tell you the number of times that I have come there and just not been affirmed by my father. But I do it anyway. And I come, and I walk into the room. Here are the first words my dad says to me. What are you doing here? Oh. <clears throat> Damn. I'm 60. And this is still young. And I say, what do you mean, Dad? Listen carefully. He says, your grandbabies are over in Marion, Indiana. What are you doing here with me? Okay. Where did this come from? <laughs> and then 
out of absolutely nowhere, he says to me, when was the last time I told you I was proud of you? Now, I really want to say, old man, you never said that to me. I've been trying all. He did. He said, Dad, it's been a long time. He said, son, I could not be more proud. Now listen to me very carefully when I say this. You may be trying to find the affirmation of somebody as a part of your life. But you have a heavenly Father in every moment of every day is saying this. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. I was trying to find the affirmation of my humanly father, and I missed the fact that my divine father has been saying that every moment of every day. Friends, please, allow this word to speak into your heart now. As I mentioned yesterday, the amazing thing about this, Jesus has not done anything yet. Do not try to do something to earn the Father's love. Would it be okay if I just simply say, bask in the glory of the Holy Spirit conveying the message of the Father to you? Hubert was talking about prayer is dancing. Um, I'd actually say all of life is dancing. That may not be a very good Wesleyan thing to say. <laughs> but let's keep that amongst ourselves. Is that okay? Can I give you a nice Greek word? Parakoresis. Parakoresis. As the early church was trying to define the relationship of the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit, <coughs> how do we describe this three and one? What? How do we describe it? They called it the perichoritic dance of the Trinity. That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, is it okay to use the term, dancing together? We as Westlands, we, we like, uh, we like Good Friday, the cross. Maybe we like Easter a little bit better. You know what? You know what? Um, event in the church history we really don't celebrate all that well is Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit actually comes down and Gary takes you by the hand and says, would you like to dance with the Trinity? Let me invite you into the divine dance that you can dance in perfect harmony with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on here. Let's not miss it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are there in this Mark and story. And they're inviting us into this divine unity. Jesus says this, come, follow me. Who would say no to that? Don't ever say no to that. Because when you're marching with them, every moment of every day, they're saying this, you are my beloved daughter. And you, I am well pleased. And you're out somewhere else trying to find somebody else to affirm me. A boss, a father, a husband, a wife. You're trying to find somebody else. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is saying, right here, come. Allow me to envelop you. And then immediately, immediately, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness. I don't know about you, I don't like that kind of language. I kind of like it to be, the Holy Spirit invites you to participate to, in the wilderness. <laughs> no, no, no. The word is akbalo. It's the same word used of Jesus actually casting out evil spirits. The Holy Spirit says, the agenda of the Father is for you to be tempted. Personally, I don't like that. 
But it's not my opinion that matters, is it? It's God's. He goes out into the wilderness. Does the term wilderness mean anything to you? <laughs> you, need to be, you need to be possessors of the whole meta narrative of the Bible. Not just Mark, the whole Bible. The wilderness. God chose, chose, elect. You can use whatever Wesleyan word you want. Selected Israel to be the chosen people to be brought out of Egypt into the wilderness to meet God. They go to Mount Sinai and they actually meet this guy named Yahweh. For the Jews, it's an unpronounceable word. And he actually gives them his commands. Writing them on a tablet. And then God tells them, I'm going to give you a land. And it's going to be my gift to you. Now listen carefully. By day there is a pillar of smoke that they can actually physically see God. By night there is a pillar of fire. When they're hungry, they have manna. When they moan and groan and complain, he gives them, he, he gives them uh, birds to be able to eat. He gives them water when they're thirsty. All of their needs are cared for, and they visually see him by day. And then Moses sends out 12 spies to check out the land. Ten of them come back and say, I'm sorry, but we are just grasshoppers, and they are giants. They see them. They don't see him. The wilderness is the place where God has revealed himself to them, and they reject. They are being tested. Very clear what Deuteronomy says. They are being tested, and they come up short. For then, for 40 years, they wander in that wilderness. Until nobody but the, the two spies that actually come back with a faithful response actually get into the promise. The wilderness is the place of Israel's greatest failure. And that's the first place that Jesus goes. Please, do not think for a moment that the book of Mark is about finding a way to forgive sins. Don't forget, I mean, if you read the Old Testament, read Leviticus, there is already forgiveness of sins there. This is so much more. He is going to actually buy back that which has been stolen from him. Not just forgiveness of sin, he is going to actually recreate the universe the way it's meant to be. This is territory that Satan has taken. And the very first place Jesus goes is to take it back. Please do not trivialize what Jesus is doing. He is not just making forgiveness of sins a possibility. He is making true the call of God to redeem the entire universe. Do not make his work too little. It is this big. The very first place he goes is to take back what was lost. So do not be surprised when I say to you, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's an area of your life that you have not given back to Jesus. <clears throat> You've heard my story. Drugs, alcohol. I mean, it's ugly. And if you know anybody that's had severe problems with drugs, um, there are stories of shame in my life that are unbearable. Are there any of those in your mind? Are there things that you even remind God because they're that bad. That's the very first place that Jesus goes. The area of Israel's greatest historic <laughs> sin and shame. That's the place where Jesus goes. And he wins the victory. <laughs> this is not just about forgiveness.
forgiveness of sin. This is holiness at the core. That you can be white as snow. So those areas of my life, why do I need to give them to Jesus? Because he's paid for them. They're his. And if I cling to them, I'm a thief. Am I making sense? I declare to you, I declare to you that the place of wilderness in your life can be transformed just like it is in Isaiah chapter 35 where he declares, in the wilderness, crocuses will grow up. Rivers of living water will flow. He will transform a wilderness into a place of glory. That's his goal. His goal is not just to forgive you of your sins so you can get to heaven. He wants you to become a purveyor of new creation in this world now. So don't be surprised. Some of the people I speak into more than anything else are actually drug addicts and alcoholics. Because I know their pain. And they know I know. We speak the same language. If you give over to Jesus your wilderness experience, watch out. You might actually be, become one of those people to become part of the call of the community. Watch out. Jesus is coming for you to change your life and to be just like his. But your word is living and active, and we know that. So I ask this morning. As we go, we go transformed with the promise. The areas of our life that may be wilderness can, be, can become rivers of living water. Speak hope to a broken world. If he can do it for us, he can do it for them. May we testify to the grace of God through the voice of our lives. Go with that.